My name is Heidi Patmore. I'm a consultant, speaker, entrepreneur, board member, investor. I know it sounds like a lot. I have five different business cards. You can come get one afterwards. So I'd like to tell you a little bit today about um, the research I've done on flying cars, which we call passenger drones. There's a couple of different types out there. Um, how did I get into drones? Well, the interwebs. I saw stuff online and I was like, oh, this looks pretty cool. So um, I went and found out how much it cost to buy a DJI, which is like a really, really cool drone. It was 40,000 Rand. I was like, no, no, I'm not that into drones. So I went and bought this 1,000 Rand thing from Hamleys and uh, started having a lot of fun with it. And it just kind of got me into the drone space and researching about it and figuring out what it was all about. So today what I'm going to tell you about is the dawn of a new industry. But actually, it's not this one that I'm talking about with flying cars. I'm going to go back 150 years. 150 years ago, if you lived in New York City, this is what Broadway looked like. People walking around in the streets, horses and carriages. And just like today, they had innovation back then as well. So if you were quite wealthy and you had a bit of prestige, you could roll with your honeys in a horse and carriage. <laughs> like, check how cool they look. I mean, this guy. Innovation's been around a long time. And in, in the 1800s, innovation took the form of <coughs> the Stockholm Telephone Tower. So if you wanted to make a call in Stockholm in 1887, you had to actually be physically connected by cables that ran into the tower. That's how you made a telephone call, right? The first guy that decided he wanted to breathe underwater invented this. This is Chester E. Remington, and he actually created the first diving suit in the world. Hands up if you'd like to try the world's first diving suit. Okay, because when innovation... Oh, <laughs> that's two oaks. Okay, well done. <laughs> um, because to me, this looks like a steel coffin. Okay, but someone had the idea, let's go and get underwater and see if we can breathe. Okay. This is the uh, Velocipede. It's actually the patent for the first motorbike. And it's actually um, steam powered. So you actually sat on the part where the steam came out, which I'm not so keen about, but that's what the design was in the time. So the point I'm trying to make here is often when new things are innovated, it seems so weird and strange when it first comes out, and yet 100 years later, it's totally normal for us. So I wouldn't be a consultant if I didn't put the word disruption on my slides. So there it is. So back in the late 1800s, disruption happened. And the way that it happened was the invention of the horseless carriage. That lovely gentleman there is Carl Benz and his lovely wife Bertha next to him. And this was the first horseless carriage or motor car, motor, motor, motorless carriage or horseless carriage. And this was called Victoria. Now, when this car first came to market, people were quite terrified. They were using horses and carriages at the time. So the idea of something being able to drive without, you know, like being able to pull the reins and stop the horse was quite terrifying. It was so terrifying, in fact, that people called it the devil wagon. Okay, true story. The legislators at the time were so scared of the new technology that they created legislation called the Red Flag Law, and I'm going to tell you what it did. So the Red Flag Law had three parts. First, if you wanted to buy a horseless carriage from Carl Benz, you could only drive it at six kilometers an hour. Okay, I'll show you how, how fast that is. That, this is six kilometers an hour, okay? The walking pace. The second thing, if you bought this, you had to have a mechanic in the car any time you drove it, in case something went wrong. <laughs> there was a mechanical brake, the, the mechanic was in the car with you, okay? And thirdly, by law, you had to have someone walking 50 meters ahead with a red flag to tell you when to stop. Okay, true story. So I think this is quite hilarious, but it's not that far off from how we um, feel about technology today. Our friends across the pond did one better when their red flag law said that if they were passing another piece of livestock or horses, this is what you had to do by law. Stop the car. Okay. Disassemble the car. <laughs> hide the car parts in the bushes. That was the law. That's what you had to do. So it makes me think of this term called neophobia, which is the fear of the new. And I think it's something that mankind goes through over and over and over. First of all, 
Um, three guesses as to who the legislators were that called it the de devil wagon and hugely lobbied against it. Any, any ideas? Not the Democrats. <laughs> Not the GOP. Horse breeders. Okay, because they were going to go out of business because now horseless carriages were no longer a thing. So even my friends have neophobia because when I post on Facebook that I'm doing a drone talk about flying cars, those are the comments I get. So even my own mates think I'm a bit mad that I'm in this space. Never mind. Because in 2017, no one is driving a flying car, but it's coming. The first time I heard about a passenger drone was last year at CES. I wish I'd been there, but I just followed the interwebs like everyone else. And a company called eHang put this on their showroom floor at CES. They didn't announce it, they didn't do any like, hype or whatever, but when people saw this, it made headlines around the world. So that will set you back two and a half million rand if you want to go and buy an eHang 184. I contacted them, I asked them, and uh, they told me I can't be the distributor for Africa yet. They're still working on their strategy. But this led me to getting to thinking, who are the other industry players? Like, is this the only drone out there that flies? Like, how, like who else is doing this? What has been going on? So I put together a couple of slides to show you some of the different manufacturers that are in this space. There's currently 15 manufacturers um, actually with working prototypes. And I was at the commercial UAV show last year, and I met the guy from the FAA who is granting licenses to flying car manufacturers. And there are currently six manufacturers actually testing flying cars at a secret location in the Nevada desert. He could only tell me that much <laughs> when I asked him. So that's pretty impressive. Six manufacturers are actually doing actual tests at the moment. So this is coming. So there's a couple of categories. Uh, this is quite an old school category. So if you see some of the guys who have been building, been claiming to build fine cars for a while, it's literally a car that they've put wings on. So I'll show you a couple of those. This is Carplane, they're from Germany. This is actually licensed to fly in uh, Germany at the moment. I mean, licensed to drive. So you're allowed to drive this on the Autobahn in Germany, but you're not allowed to fly it in the air. Okay, the legislation has prohibited it. This is a company called Terrafugia. They were started in 2006 by ex-MIT graduates. And even though they've been going for a while, they've got working prototypes. Um, their flying car model, which is this one, the Transition, um, folds up its wings and then drives on the road like that. Okay? Uh, you can place an order for this today if you have a $10,000 deposit. You can actually go and buy one. This is their next model that's coming out. It's called the TFX. And similar concept, it's not actually at production stage yet. It also folds up its wings. It's just a little bit sexier than the old school Eddie's one that the other one is. This company is Aeromobile. They're from Slovakia. They actually exhibited at the Paris Air Show two weeks ago. And they keep claiming that this thing works, but I've yet to see it. They haven't got any videos that actually show that this thing is in the sky. They call it a roadable aircraft which means that you can drive it on the road, but you can also fly it. You have to be a, a, a licensed flight pilot, though, to fly it, which, is, which to me is not that useful. Um, and then they, they go on about it being autonomous, which means the software flies the plane, but it's really just a version of autopilot, which is what commercial planes have. These guys are PAL-V. This is called a gyrocopter. And it's quite complicated to fly because it's like a microlight. You've actually got to know what the rotors are doing. You've got to have some sort of skill to fly it. It's got pedals, and if you do pedals, then the back moves, and then it actually takes you to where you want to go. And that's what it looks like on the road. So if you've got 130,000 rand, you can place a deposit on this one. And if you want to shell out for the special edition one, it's 8 million rand. So obviously 8 million rand is a bit prohibitive, so a couple of manufacturers have gone with a lesser version of um, a flying car, and it's a flying motorbike essentially. And these are a couple of the concepts that are floating around the interwebs at the moment. This is the Drone Taxi R1, also just in conceptual stage, but has been patented. And uh, the company Hoversurf actually makes the Scorpion Hoverbike. This um, video did the rounds on the internet uh, like a couple of months ago. You might have seen the guy in the warehouse on this thing. Um, I'm a bit concerned about this because I don't think you should have to like, dress up in gear and a helmet and that sort of stuff to fly to work. Like you should be able to just get to work, you know? 
Um, Aerofix also makes a similar hover bike. This is quite cool. They tell you that you can learn to fly this in a weekend. Okay, so weekend lesson, and now you can fly this thing. And the way that this bike works is that it works with your body. So as you move it, it goes in the direction that you want to fly. And these guys, Kitty Hawk, you might have heard of them. They're quite famous because Sergey Brin from Google is one of the investors. Okay, so when I heard that Sergey Brin from Google was investing in, drone, in a drone company, I got super excited. I was like, oh, they're going to be the best one, you know? Um, and I was so disappointed when they bought this out because I'm like, what? I don't understand. It only flies over water. Like, they've designed it as like a boat that flies over the water, okay? Um, it doesn't look too safe to me. Like, this, this, this whole design to me doesn't, like, I'm not keen on it. Anyway, uh, moving on to passenger drones like the Ehang 184 that I showed you earlier. This is a company called Joby S2, US company. They've got quite a beautiful machine. I quite like the concept here. What I especially like is that the rotors, um, as you're taking off in the air, are one way, and then as you reach your gliding sort of space, the, the, wings fold, fold, the rotors fold back like wings or little petals. So I think that's pretty cool. I like that design. Um, the next one is Volocopter. The company's called eVolo. Uh, this is also quite a cool um, passenger drone, but the, the flaw with this one, when I went and researched it further, so there's a guy in there, he's giving the thumbs up, cool. Um, someone on the ground is physically flying with a remote. Look, so they are flying you to your destination, like a guy on the ground, okay? So I was like, no, nah, that's like a big fancy DJI. I don't, I don't think that's a cool concept. But um, interesting, it's interesting to see what people have come up with because it's never been done before, you know? Um, now this fugly thing um, is by a company called Tactical Robotics. They're a military company actually, so they actually supply this to the military to go and um, evacuate people from places where a helicopter can't get to. So I like the concept, it is remotely flown, so some guy in a container in the desert is flying the other guy out the war zone, um, which I think is quite cool. And it can take, um, the cool thing about this is it takes two full people. So it's one of the drones that can take, <laughs> okay, geez, get your mind out the gutter. Yo, it's like for, you know, people who've um, been killed, like, you know, falling apart in battle, bleeding from their heads, you know. Um, and then this is quite a cool one as well. So Cartivator has just been given four and a half million rand from Toyota to develop the sky car concept. And the idea, because they're a Japan-based company, the idea is that um, one of these drones, flying drones, will have a person in it to light the flame at the Olympics in 2020, which I think is quite a cool idea. Except that with all things drone, how you design it and how you thought it was going to happen isn't always how it actually does happen. Then the fourth category is what I like to call, it doesn't have a name, so I just made a name for it. Um, I'd call it the mini jet, which is basically your own little private personal plane. But you don't have to be a pilot to fly it. Um, Airbus have recently announced a couple of um, developments in this field. They've announced their first aircraft called Vahana, which is really, really beautiful. And one that I particularly like, now that we're getting closer to what I think actually could happen in the future, um, this is called their pop-up. And this little pod over here actually is a self-driving car, right? But then it's modular, so it detaches, and it becomes a self-driving drone. And the best part is that they've also designed it to fit into a Hyperloop. So if Elon Musk ever gets the Hyperloop right, they want to pop it in there as well. So I, I researched all these different manufacturers and I kind of got around to thinking, but why would you fly? Like, what would be the benefit? It seems like such an expensive thing. Like, is this really going to happen? Like, are we all going to choose tomorrow to go and buy a, a flying car instead of a normal car? So I started thinking about, like, why would you want to get a car, a flying car? Hands up if you love traffic. Okay. okay. So um, cities at the moment are at their capacity in terms of infrastructure. So there is only one way to go up, which is, which is up. Mega cities which have 10 million people or more in them actually can take like up to 90 minutes for people to do a one-way commute to work. So there's definitely a need to cut out normal city traffic and stress. Um, so I'm a consultant, so I go and see clients during the day. And this is where I live. Don't fucking stalk me. And that is where my client was one day. 
So I worked out just on average, if I need to go and see someone in Northgate, it'll take me 50 minutes to drive there. Like if I'm lucky in the traffic on the highway, pay my ETOL, et cetera, et cetera. Then I was like, but if I had an Ehang 184, it would take me six minutes, okay? So there is a real benefit for this concept because who wouldn't want to cut out all of that time in the traffic? And who would want to cut out that stress? Like imagine like you're floating over everyone, watching the oaks in the traffic below, you know, sorry, poor suckers. You know, like it's, it's like, like it's a quite an appealing concept to fly. Like that's a cool thing. Um, it would completely reduce carbon emissions because most of the manufacturers who are kind of on top of things are all developing electric, okay, or other power sources, renewable energy. You'd also reduce accidents because ideally you'd want these to be autonomous. So if you're reducing human error, you reduce accidents, which makes a ton of sense. And lastly, I couldn't resist. It's fucking cool. <laughs> like, who wouldn't want to be a pilot? Like, who wouldn't want to fly to work every day, you know? So I think that's pretty awesome. So then that led me to thinking, so what would you use this for? Like, what are the things that people are actually going to use a flying car for? And there's been a couple of use cases discussed. But I really think that personal aviation and air taxi is where it's really going to make the most difference. So what does my flying car need to have? Well, first of all, it's got to be 100% safe. I'm not getting in that thing if it looks like the diving suit from 1911, okay? Uh, two of the manufacturers that I profiled earlier um, have already stated that even if everything mechanical fails and everything electrical fails, they've actually got parachutes in the flying car. So that will deploy so that you hopefully don't die when you hit the ground. So that is an essential thing. The other thing is that it'll, it'll be software based, so there'll need to be really strong encryption because no one wants their car to get hacked, you know, like that could really cause a lot of problems. So manufacturers really need to think that's like the paramount most important thing in terms of a flying car. It's got to be, this is a new term, if you're into drones, learn this, VT, VTOL, it used to be pronounced VTOL, and it stands for Vertical Takeoff and Landing. Now, Terrafugia and Aeromobile, you have to have a runway to fly that thing. So where are you going to find a runway in your city? You're not going to fly to, go to OR, drive to OR Tambo to take off to go to Sanson. You know, like it needs to actually go up and down. It needs to be a reasonable cost. Now, it's all very well to say Ehang 184 is two and a half million rand, but the cheapest um, helicopter that I could find was this one. It's called a Robinson 44, and you can pick one up secondhand. You can actually go to Gumtree and buy one. It's um, five and a half million for a 2009 version. You can actually go and buy this today. So I was like, sure, that's quite a lot of money, hey? Like, I don't know if I'd be prepared to pay like five and a half million rand just to have a flying car. And then I was like, oh, but hang on. If you go and buy the Aston Martin DB9, that's four and a half million rand. So maybe people are prepared to pay a lot of money for the tech that they want, if it does the thing that they want. And if you want to get completely stupid, this thing is a 62 million rand car, which only celebrities drive, because there's only 50 in the world. So, you know, if someone wants to spend a lot of money for the tech that they want, they'll do it, even if it's 62 bar, which I think is stupid money. But anyway. What else does it need to have? It needs to be noiseless. If you're going to be landing this thing in your, in your driveway, your neighbors are going to start complaining if it's noisy. And that's a particular problem with drones. Because anyone who's flown a drone here, hands up, anyone who's in the drone space, oh, drone techies, yeah, cool. Um, it's really loud. And those things, I mean, even that video I showed you earlier, it's like super loud. Now, you can't have that landing like next to you every morning while some guy's going to go and do his commute. So it needs to be noiseless. It's got to be autonomous. I just want to press a button and then it flies me to the roof of Sandton City. I don't want to have to think of anything other than that, like just to press something on my iPad. And then, it needs to be comfortable. If I'm going to get in this thing, it mustn't be like, you know, oh, I don't want to sit in it all day. Even though I'm going to be saving a lot of time, it needs to be comfortable. And then finally, it needs to be beautiful. Like, I really appreciate good design. That's why I said some of those other ones are seriously fugly. Would not buy them. But manufacturers need to start thinking like this. We're discerning consumers. We want beautiful stuff. So make the tech beautiful. So let's fast forward to the future. This is Johannesburg in 2017. It's actually the view from, I think it's like, you know where St. John's is? It's like a photo from there. But in 2027, this is what our skies are going to be looking like. There'll be a band of airspace for planes, a band of airspace for flying cars, and a band of airspace for drones. Okay, so delivery drones, all the other stuff that you see um, in terms of where drone uh, technology is going. 
And that's how our, 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 our skies are going to be split. So I've actually been doing a lot of thinking about, like, do I really want that? Like, I quite like the beautiful view. <laughs> but I'm telling you that in 10 years' time, we're just going to see these, like, robots across the sky. That's what it's going to look like. We're going to have to learn different terms and figure out different ways of actually implementing this into our cities. So a vertiport is a new thing that we're going to be, you know, in, in, implementing into our infrastructure, which is basically, like, where am I going to walk to to go and hop into my flying car. This is a Lilium pad, which I don't know why they didn't just call it Lily pad, because Lilium is a flying car manufacturer, and this is their concept for, you know, you'd go to like the little Lily pad to get onto the, um, your flying car. And there's another one, like a couple of other things, like in terms of vocabulary, we'll hear about things like skyways. There'll actually be specific corridors for drones only. So they'll have to actually, you know, figure out where those drones are and are not allowed to go for safety reasons. And then we're going to have to have intelligent air traffic control. When this thing hits, you're going to have 100 times more air traffic in the air than you have today. So the software is going to have to work out the kinks for you. It's all going to have to be autonomous. We're going to have to have sense and avoid technology so these things don't crash into each other. And regulators are going to have to catch up which they're not at the moment. I don't know if anyone's dealt with the CAA here. You have, I know. <laughs> so, not a diss. Um, so, and at the moment, regulators don't know what to do here. Like, they've, they've given special licenses in certain parts of the world, and some of the cities like Dubai and Singapore and, I think, Dallas, have been very outspoken in saying, we're going to support this, and we will give you licenses to test this, and we'll assist you with fitting it into society. But... That essentially is the biggest hurdle to making this a reality. Now, one of the concepts that is most interesting about this whole project is the fly-on-demand space. And this, to me, is the most exciting thing because I think it's the closest that we're going to get to someone actually implementing what they want to do in the space. And I don't know how many people have heard about this, but Uber has a project called Elevate. And they are heavily, excuse the pun, driving this and they are working with all the manufacturers, all the regulators, to try and make Uber for the, for the skies a reality. So what they think is that, for example, this is Dallas-Fort Worth um, International Airport, and to get there in an Uber X to Frisco is an hour and 10 minutes. Okay? But if you take Uber Air, which is what they patented, it would take you eight minutes. So it's a no-brainer. And who better to drive it than Uber? The concept is push a button, get a flight, you would, you would hail an air taxi exactly the same as you, as you hail an Uber these days. So with a couple of little edits, like uh, take Uber X to Skyport, um, take Elevator to the ninth floor. You know, so they've like, they're thinking about all of this. Like they've already thought out, like how are we going to get people to the top of a building so that the, the aircraft can actually fly off there? So to me, this is one of the most exciting projects that's actually out there. They held an Uber Elevate conference in April. You can actually go, I got all of this um, from the website where they've actually published all of the videos that they took at the conference and all of the slide decks. So you can literally go and read their entire project plan. They've also got a white paper about it. You can go download that and like, anyone can access that. And their long-term plan is to make air taxis actually more, ex more um, cost-effective than owning your own car, which to me makes a huge amount of sense. And at the very least, have it sort of priced on the same as UberX. So that's Uber. Um, super exciting. I did try and get Uber here tonight to give some comments, but Justin was like, no, no, I can't talk about that. You know, so, um, yeah, I think it's a super exciting concept. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you.